Job chapter 1, verse 21. This is the conclusion, of course, of Job's great trials. Uh, maybe we read verse 20. And Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We hope today to get on to the issue of time management. And so I thought this was an appropriate text to briefly consider, uh, touching as it does on life in general. Um, let me try and bring up that slide. Looks like I've lost that slide somewhere along the way. Let's just, um, I'll give you the four points verbally. Life is brief, Job says, basically here. I came and I shall return. Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return. This really sums up life, doesn't it? I came and I shall return. One person somewhere in the world is being born every second. And another person somewhere in the world is dying every second. Secondly here, life is vain. Job has learned the vanity of everything that he had accumulated throughout his life. He said, naked I came, naked I return." And so the question is, what is it about all these possessions and all this property and all these things and all this stuff that we accumulate throughout our years here? We come naked, we leave naked, and everything in between, well, so much vanity, so much emptiness. Thirdly, life is controlled. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Now, Job didn't say that he earned, he deserved, he merited, he worked for all these things. He said the Lord gave it. But he also said the Lord has taken away. It wasn't an accident, it wasn't the devil, it wasn't the Sabaeans. It was the Lord. It wasn't chance, it wasn't necessity, it was providence. He that gave has taken. Everything is under the Lord's sovereign control. And then fourthly, life is to glorify God. This is all preceded by this phrase, he fell on the ground and worshipped. And at the end of verse 21, he blesses the name of the Lord. So he sees here that although the devil's purpose was to make Job curse God, the result is worship of God. So four points about life. Life is brief, life is vain, life is controlled, and life is to glorify God. Let's pray. We do thank you, Lord, for life. It's a great gift. And for the life you've given us up to this point, that you've sustained us and given us the health and strength to be here today. But we pray for help to remember how brief this life is and how, how much vanity we, we attach to it and accumulate in it. Help us to realize that one day it shall also be said of us, he came naked, he left naked. Mm -hmm. we, shall, we shall return to you. And our arrival and departure times are on your timetable, Lord. You're sovereign. And so we come before you as Job did also. In his lack, we come largely in our plenty and say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Help us to use this time on earth, this brief, vain, controlled time for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. I know what I've done wrong. I've got the wrong keynote. There are the points. So, we are going through the social media maven, or guru, 
We had been looking at the leader as a communicator and then specifically here as a communicator using social media. And we saw Al Mohler's vital quote, if a leader's not leading in the digital world, his leader is, by definition, limited to those who also ignore or neglect that world and that population is shrinking every minute. Mm -hmm. So we talked about taking a positive reproach, asking ourselves the why question, uh, prioritizing one social media channel. Let me scoot through to where we're at. We're under the headline number four. If we can get to it. Be sociable. And we looked at, first of all, make it two-way. Then we looked at reveal. Then we looked at add value. And then fourthly here, we're at learn from experts. Eric Qualman wrote in The Digital Leader, Determine a digital leader you admire. Spend at least 20 minutes a day watching his or her activity. Pay attention to who he is conversing with. What topics does she post and in what tone? Why does he post? When does she post? Where does he post? What tools or sites does he use? The best digital mentor is generally someone that's in your industry or shares similar interests. Someone that you find intriguing. Learn from these mentors and practice what they are doing. Anyone, any suggestions for this? I'll, I'll tell you the two people I have learned most from. And uh, that is, first of all, Tim Challies. And the other is Michael Hyatt. Now, Tim is much more overtly Christian. Obviously, that's his whole message, really. Um, at a popular level... Uh, he's really a broad blogger, uh, really the whole area of Christian living. And he touches on doctrinal issues too, but his focus is on Christian living. Michael High is a bit different. He is a professing Christian. He used to be chairman of Thomas Nelson. But his blog is not overtly Christian. It deals a lot with leadership, with management, with productivity, uh, relationships. And, and he's got this very strong area now of you know, using social media. I, I'm, a, I'm quite cautious about some of what he does in that area. Uh, he wrote the book Platform, you might remember, which I felt was lacking in a Christian basis. And um, I felt quite uncomfortable with the whole idea, I suppose, of you know, consciously, deliberately cultivating a platform um, but, but I still think there's a lot to learn from these two men and how they, they use social media uh, for uh, personal and ministry purposes I, I, I read a lot of blogs and stuff but these are the two men that, that I, I learn from, don't copy slavishly but I do learn a lot from anyone else get someone that they find is a good model to follow No? Okay. I just found um, Al Muller. I read his book on leadership. Mm -hmm. And you were talking, and he's got all kinds of stuff hmm. on the blog. And he, and he takes time to think about what he's going to say. Right. He just, so, and, and then he has a, but then he does keep people up to date right. by giving them a podcast every day. Yep. And I thought that's pretty neat. And I, I, I enjoy that, always keeping up to date on what he's, he's talking about. And then other people who have used Sermon Audio um, who do a daily show, instead of having it on radio, put it on Sermon right. Audio. Yep. The one area Al Mohler, I feel, does fall in, I, I mean, I think his, his stuff is fantastic on the whole, but he isn't into social media. Mm -hmm. He is a broadcaster, as it were. You know, to comment on his blog, um, there's really not much in the way of a social um, element to it. There's still a great need for what he does, and probably if he opened it up, he wouldn't have time to do the things that he does do. 
So you've got to consciously make these sort of decisions as well. You might want to follow that kind of pattern in a smaller way, obviously. I would really encourage you to get some models. Try and figure out. If you're going to lead in this area, then do, do find an expert or two and, and learn from them. From their mistakes as well as from their, their good points. Um, e, mix it up. One of the things I don't like about Michael Hyatt's blog is it's very predictable in form. He follows a format for every blog post and he's quite open about that. He learned it at a writing conference and now he practices it all the time. So you can always predict sort of the way it'll be laid out, the, the pattern it will follow. I, I think it's much better to just mix it up, vary length, vary frequency, vary the subjects of posts, experiment a bit to see what works, what doesn't. I think it should, should reflect the material, not all material fits a certain format. And be patient. Now, I'm afraid the blogosphere and the Twitterverse are not just waiting for you to arrive. I'm really sorry about that. But they're not. They're not holding their breath. You will probably likely have, if you start a blog, something like 10 or 20 regular readers to begin with. And um, like everything in life, it takes a lot of time to build. There, there are very few uh, silver bullets. There's, there's no magic formula. You may do the odd thing that will give you a little peak for a time, but it will probably default back. And so you have to really think long term, building bit by bit, reader by reader, follower by follower, in order to make a success of it. And you've got to be patient. You can't just say, well, I'm only 20 people reading this, sometimes only 10. What is the point? Well, everyone begins like that. You can read Michael Hyatt's history. You can read Tim, Ch Tim Challies will tell you. He started his blog for his family, um, putting photos up, and then did a couple of book reviews for them that somehow got onto search machines, and it just sort of gradually took off from there. So we've got to be patient. Uh, be accountable. I'd recommend Social Media Heart Check by Tim Challies. And uh, he explains in that how you can actually access all your Facebook activity at a glance. What you've seen, people you've searched for, comments you've left, things you've liked. And he suggests sitting down with your wife quite regularly and reviewing this. And uh, ask for input from elders, friends. Am I, am I creating a good impression or a bad impression? What's helpful? Uh, is it the real me that people are seeing, or is it some sort of false version of me I'm presenting? Am I, am I just making controversy, or am I peacemaking as well? Um, am, I, am I just using this as a diversion from real problems, real ministry issues on my doorstep? Uh, am I modeling and mentoring by my social media presence and practice? Am I taking a regular digital Sabbath, a weekly time of unplugging, and maybe even a digital fast for longer periods to allow spiritual growth? Mm -hmm. For myself, I try not to do email, Twitter, Facebook, blog on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I try not to be in the blogosphere on a Sunday or Twitter or Facebook. Um, I also, when I go on vacation now, try to totally unplug probably still post things on the blog, but it's usually things that have been scheduled for a week or so before. Saturday is a minimal day for me as well. I don't post anything. I hardly ever check, really. So you just find your own place. Um, but be accountable. I tell my wife what my plan is, so she quite often asks me, you know, did you, did you blog today on Sunday or did you check email today on Sunday and things like that. And that's okay. Sometimes I have to say yes. Mm -hmm. But um, I know she's going to ask, so that influences my behavior. Um, you can also find social media policies online for churches. You know, if you're doing this as a church thing, then you can just do a search for church social media policies. 
A lot of these big mega churches have produced really good documents for their employees, large ministry teams, which you can really learn from for your own use, but also if you're doing this as any part of a team effort in a church. R.C. Sproul Jr. suggests five questions to ask before posting on social media. If my mother, pastor, spouse, children were to read this, would they be ashamed of me? Where is this coming from? Anger, pride, self-righteousness? Have I practiced a judgment of charity toward the person I'm writing about or responding to? Am I seeking to serve Jesus with this post or am I seeking my own? Am I casting perils before swine? So be accountable and then delegate. So if your church has a social media presence, a Facebook page or something like that, you, you probably want somebody to be involved in welcoming people to that page when they like you or sign up or whatever. It can often be people deciding whether they will physically go to your church or are they welcomed even digitally. And you, you, I would hope your, your members will want to share your sermons and your blogs and things like that. Just to, again, be a witness in social media. So be sociable. Number five, learn the lingo. In social nomics, Eric Qualman argued that companies, institutions and even individuals who did not adapt to and harness the new world of social media would severely limit their usefulness and effectiveness. And in his latest book, Digital Leader, Eric Qualman argued that companies, institutions, and even in, sorry, in his latest book, Eric calls leaders to face and harness digital technology for their work and for their businesses. Yeah, I think it's a really useful book. Um, it's not directed to churches or whatever, but I think many of the the challenges and opportunities that businesses face are similar to churches. And now I went through that book and I picked out uh, some key phrases, uh, a digital vocabulary, if you like, that challenge us to understand this new world and harness it for the good of the church. What's a digital footprint? Well, that's the information we post about ourselves online. We're leaving them all over the place. Digital shadows are what others post about us online. A digital legacy is what people will find online when they search for us a hundred years from now. Digital celebrities, obviously people have become famous for what they do online. The digital realm, this merged public and private world, that means we can hardly have both a private and public life. They're increasingly becoming one and the same. Digital profile. 81% of children under the age of two have images of them posted online. 25% have an online presence before they are even born. Digital tools. Well, that's whatever simplifies life in this digital world. Digital native, somebody who grew up with technology as part of their world. It's the opposite of a digital immigrant, which is what I am. Probably most of you are digital natives. No? Okay. I went through the whole school without seeing a computer in my classroom. I went through, went through the whole of university without using a computer. It was only in my second year of seminary that I got my first computer. That shows you how old I am. And it, <laughs> it was a Packard Bell in this huge box. I think it was a 20 megabyte hard drive or something like that. Megabyte hard drive. Anyway, um, digital mining. This is how people are collecting information about us online. Digital bouquets, the passing on of encouragement using technology. Digital therapy, increasingly happening, where counselling is given online or over the phone rather than face-to-face. -face. Digital peer pressure, just works the same way as the face-to-face, flesh-to-flesh version. 
digital deputies. Um, police are increasingly using Facebook, YouTube videos to catch criminals, looters, rioters. In fact, um, I have a, let me just call him a friend, he's a Scottish policeman who, um, has, who told me how many criminals he had caught using Facebook. It was quite amazing. Uh, digital oysters, the multiple online wealth making opportunities, a digital log, posting online of daily goals. People are doing this more and more. Here are my goals for the day. Keep me accountable. Helps to motivate people. Digital currency, that's the connections you have. The more connections, the more friends, more followers, the richer you are. A digital drain, the amount of time a company devotes to responding to negative online publicity. Digital hugs, pretty obvious. Digital voice, digital tone. What your online presence, communication says about you. So learn the lingo. Number six, take a break. Uh, we've really touched on that already, but I, I do think that we should try at least one day a week, take a complete break from social media. Number seven, never let it become a substitute. Mustn't become a substitute for church, for personal interaction, for personal visitation, for personal evangelism. As Colin Hansen said, I respect church leaders who abstain from social media, yet I see no reason we should neglect the remarkable possibilities for teaching and leadership offered by instant, unrestricted communication to, to willing audiences. Still, I expect over the long term that tweets, status updates and blog posts will pale in influence compared to our everyday tangible pursuit of holiness and love with the support of our local church. Mm -hmm. I think we need to bear that really, bear that in mind very much at the front of our minds. It can sometimes be very easy to look at somebody with, you know, they're in the top 100 bloggers or they've got 100,000 followers on Twitter or whatever and think, whoa, man, they must be so influential. They must be doing so much good for the kingdom. Well, time will tell, eternity will tell, for sure. It may be that the completely unknown pastor actually does more lasting good just serving his local church than the person who's the digital celebrity. I mean, we're not talking here about popularity, how well known. We're talking about spiritual fruit, spiritual good, soul saved. Has a blog ever saved a soul? I actually, I'm sure it has, but I've never heard of it. Sermons have in local churches. So for all the, you know, the, the attention given to social media, and I'm for it, I've said that from the beginning, you know, it's got to have a small place compared to our ministry in local churches. That's where the work is done. That's where most of the fruit is produced. So, I, I think social media is probably quite like Koine Greek in the early spread of the gospel. It's a, it was a common language. It was known by everybody. It was accessible, it was able to penetrate many different cultures as a result. And uh, maybe this new media, social media, will be the common language for the masses to hear the gospel, maybe. But never to become a substitute. Any thoughts? Craig? How would you counsel probably have practical experience with it, but how do you counsel a young, a young person that you notice has trouble interacting with people in the real world because they do so much online, they're buried in their iPhone or whatever, and they don't know how to say hi, I know. talk or anything like that? I know. 
Th there's very little you can do. I mean, most of the kind of work should be done in the home and in the family. We have very strict policies in our home as to, you know, when phones are allowed out, where phones are allowed, and what they're allowed to be used for. And both my sons had iPhones at one point. They've both forfeited them. And they are now on simple text phones. And... Um, but even that, we have to you know, keep a watch on and we don't allow them to be used at dinner tables. They aren't allowed to be on at family worship times. They aren't allowed in their... Well, we have actually allowed them in their rooms now, but we didn't initially. Um, they, just, they just know... You know, It's quite interesting now if the phone does go off, it's usually a text bong or something. They get quite embarrassed about it and they try and hide it. And um, that's what I wanted to develop in them. Okay. And, and to just, yeah, to actually make your kids sit down and talk. That's what dinner tables are so good for. It's not a lot of time you spend at them each day, but over time, that's where kids develop their social skills. And um, there's very little anyone outside the home can do, though, Craig. If you know the home has been has allowed that to develop over many years, yeah. I think obviously in church meetings, youth groups, there should be some policy about that. Joe, yeah, just a comment um, dealing with in youth ministry matters. It's usually when we go on trips or you know conventions retreats. And we ask them to leave their phones at home. It's not kids who are urging uh, to bring them. It's the parents saying, <laughs> right. the schools are going to apply to you. Mm. You need to keep I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's so true. I fought year after year. They start harder, harder and they turn in their old phone thinking mm. you won't notice that it's old. <laughs> and they still have their new. So, But it's often the parents who are urging just to, you know, keep the keep tabs in their kids. Right. Yep. Right, let's move on to time management. We'll take a break soon. So we're looking at number eight, model, the careful timekeeper, a man with a watch. We live in one of the richest countries in the world, and yet we are suffering from much time poverty, often debilitating and painful time poverty. And I believe time is more valuable than money. It's far more limited. And it's far more difficult to recover when we lose it. So we need, first of all, a theology of time. First point is... God gives time. James 1.17 we have to start with this and recognize that time is a gift, that we don't deserve one second of time in this world. We've forfeited our right to exist. So every moment, every second of life is a gift of God. Now, if someone was standing beside me uh, giving me a dollar bill, every second or even every minute I'm pretty sure I would love him but God is standing beside us and giving us something far more valuable 
seconds, minutes and hours in this world. So God gives time. Secondly, God gives enough time. John 11 verse 9. Sometimes say, I just, I just don't have enough time. It's just you've never said that, but some people have said that. And we're rarely saying it, I know, as a complaint against God. It's not, you know, God, you haven't given me enough time today. But it does reflect upon God when we say these things. If someone gave you a hundred tasks to do in one minute, you'd view that person as unjust and unfair. Simply not enough time. But God is not unjust and he's not unfair. He has given us enough time to do all that he requires us to do. Most often, our perceived lack of time is due to either our misuse of it or doing more than what God actually requires of us. So God has given us enough time Thirdly, God gives limited time. Psalm 90 verse 10, we have a limited time on earth. It may be long, it may be short, but wherever God has set that arrival and departure time, it will not be shifted. It will not be delayed. There's a limit and we will not pass it. Fourthly, God judges our use of time. Romans 14, 12. Now we're used to the idea of God judging our words, every idle word, or our use of money, parable of the talents maybe. But the idea of God watching over our time is not so much at the forefront of our thinking. Words are audible, money is visible, but time, well it just seems so much more nebulous. So much more difficult to get a hold of. Yet, it's God's gift and therefore we will be called to give an account for our use of that time. Fifthly, God commands us to redeem time. Ephesians 5.16 To redeem means to act to secure a captured person's rescue by paying a price. To redeem time, therefore, means that we act to secure the recovery of wasted time by paying a price. So we recognize we've wasted time, we've lost time, we've given up time. We need to redeem it, we need to recover it. And that costs us something, it costs us self-discipline and it costs us self-denial. Sixthly, God offers eternal life to those who have abused time. Romans 6.23 Well, I'm sure all of us here can easily grieve and confess over the loss of time, the waste of time. Um, But God promises to restore the years the locusts have eaten. And um, that will take place largely in eternity. What a restoration. He will give us more time than we have ever taken from him. God still offers us, time wasters, the gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. So I think that's where we need to begin. We often begin with techniques and tactics and strategies. and These have a place, but we need to build that on a theology of time. Let's look secondly at devilology of time. So that's what God says about time. What does the devil say about it? What does he want us to do with our time? So I'm really saying, how would the devil teach this class to you? I think he would have three main points. First of all, he would say squander it, be a time waster. It's just letting time slip through your hands without using it 
productively. And, and it's especially easy for a pastor to fall into this. He has no time clock. He has no boss. Time can be wasted in many different ways in the ministry. By laziness, just going about our business too slowly, too half-heartedly, sleeping too long. Secondly, by disorganization, we may be running around at a terrific pace, but we're running around like headless chickens. We have no planning, we have no aims, we have no targets. Our studies, our finances, our admin, our libraries are just in a mess. We're always looking for things, losing time in that way. Inefficiency. We may not be using the right tools to simplify our task. We phone when we could do something much quicker by email. We use Strong's Concordance rather than Bible software. We write out things by hand again and again rather than using a word processor, having a template. We try to study for sermons in the afternoon when we're sleepy rather than, for many of us, first thing in the morning when we're at our brightest. We read where there are lots of distractions rather than where we can really concentrate. We squander time by inefficiency. We squander time by indiscipline. We surf the internet rather than study a text. We spend too long on the phone to friends when there are people to visit in hospital. We fail to plan our week or our day and end up aimless or simply reacting to the demands of others. I read a, a great article the other day. It was um, playing off of Nike's motto, just do it. And this guy was saying, no, don't. Just plan it. Just plan it. And I found for myself that planning makes such a difference to one's use of time. I'll come back to that. So he would say squander it. Secondly, he'd say stretch it. It's not time wasting, but time stretching. Now, what does this mean? It means lengthening our days, our working hours, so that we can do more and more work. Yes, the devil will say that too. Psalm 127 verse 2 addresses this attitude and spirit and says it's vain. And it's vain because as much research has shown, when we stretch our hours, we're really just stretching out our work to fill the hours. We're not ultimately packing more in. Many studies have been done about the 40-hour week. That, that, that figure hasn't just been picked out of the air. But what the studies show is that uh, the amount of things you get done in the week is increasing all along, starts to even off about 40, and then slides precipitously down the other side as soon as you go past 40 hours in a week. Now that's not talking about the odd week where you have to really you know, pull out all the stops. But as a pattern of life, those who work more than 40 hours a week end up doing no more than those who do work 40 hours per week. There are exceptions to that, but that's the general rule. We simply start stretching our hours. I remember when I worked in finance, it was always a great time in the year when bosses said we could do overtime. Time and a half during the week, double time on Saturday. But what, no extra work had done because overtime started at 5. So what people did was they kind of started winding down about 4.30. And then everyone would be going out for sandwiches, pizza, whatever. And that would kind of go past 5. And eventually kind of people about half 5, 5.30 are starting to work. But, you know, because of it an hour off... You know, it's taken a while to get back into the swing of things again. And 
Then people start leaving about seven after doing two hours from five till seven and there's lots of goodbyes what you're doing and this would go on like until eight and nine and just ultimately I reckon probably a maximum of about one extra hour was done mm -hmm. out of every four worked. And, and I still believe that that could have been done in the course of the day because people paced themselves. They said, well, man, I'm going to be here till eight o'clock tonight. You know, you start walking a bit slower. You start taking your time. So again, this is, this is very easy for pastors to do, to start stretching hours. And uh, because we've got no fixed hours. And yet we're not getting more done. We're just taking longer to do it. And it's amazing how quickly you can prepare a sermon when you have a deadline. Uh, some of you struggle to hand in assignments in time. Um, I'll, I'll bet you you won't struggle to preach, you get your sermons ready on time when you're in a congregation. Because it's not an option. You just get it done. You do it. So, I think on the whole, pastors should set themselves office hours, working hours. Uh, let your family know them. Let your, your wife know them. Let your elders know them. And stick with it. Unless, of course, there are exceptions. And there will always be exceptions in pastoral ministry. Number three, the devil says, squeeze it. Time squeezing. And this happens when we've got so much to do, we do nothing well. We try to squeeze so much into the day that we squeeze the quality of our work out of it. And also our joy and our satisfaction as well. We aim too high. We spend our day stressed. We end up looking back dissatisfied at all we weren't able to do. And we can sin by trying to do too little. But we can also sin by trying to do too much. You know, does it not strike you when you read the Gospels that... There just doesn't seem to be any sense of rush about the Lord Jesus, does there? There's just there's a calm, there's a there's a poise. It's, it's largely unhurried, peaceful, and yet he never sinned any sins of omission. And we somehow think we've got to like be running around at 100 miles per hour, or else we're sinning by not doing this, that, and the next thing. Some people find that the Lord did not commit sins to be the biggest miracle. For me, it's his sins, the sins of omission that he didn't commit that is the biggest marvel to me. How can you actually go through this life and, and not omit anything you were meant to do? And not omit doing what you're meant to do to a certain quality? That's just astonishing to me. Um, but when we're born, we are enrolled in the devil's time management class. This uh, is automatic. This is our instinct. This is our default. He's a dismal teacher. And even when the Son of God has disenrolled us and set us free from this, it's still hard to unlearn the lessons we've been taught by the devil. We need the Holy Spirit to empty our hearts and minds of devilology and fill them instead with theology and especially with Christology. So be aware there is a theology of time. Be aware that there is there are many temptations concerning time. There's a great op opponent that's trying to destroy your time management. So, given these principles, what about actually doing it? How do we manage our time better? Well, first thing is peace. I think the most important time for time management is the first moments of every day. First thing in the morning, get up early enough to have quiet time with God. 
Bible reading and prayer. I believe this is absolutely vital in terms of a peaceful orientation of mind and soul. It's really the foundation of a successful day of ministry. And, and the key to getting up early and having a profitable quiet time is bedtime. When you go to bed the night before. You can have all the strategies and tools and devotionals you like in the morning, but if you're not getting to bed early enough, it's not going to do you any good. If you're finding it impossible to get up early enough in an undistracted devotional time, you're going to bed too late. The success of the day really does depend on the amount of sleep you get. Now for myself, I, there's no point in me rolling out of bed and trying to read my Bible because I'm asleep again like that. So I usually have a shower first of all, shave, shower, and also have some breakfast <clears throat> because I find it just wakens me up just that first half hour. And it's, I, try, I try not to do it in a rushed way. I use the shower again just for developing a calm, peaceful, unstressed mind. And again, breakfast, just to eat it in an unhurried way, to just enjoy it. <clears throat> it's not lingering. I mean, I do most days breakfast and shower within 30, 35 minutes. But then I'm ready for my devotional time. And again, it's very important for me, maybe for many of you too, to have this done before others are up in the house. Mm -hmm. um, just find that quiet, peaceful time. Without it, my day just... I can almost guarantee it will go awry. So find a good place, find a good time, find a good strategy and, and really develop that peaceful mindset, that calm mindset. Secondly, we mentioned this, planning. Now I'm going to deal more and more as we go through this course with organisation, administration. But... Um, I think one of the good things to do is either the night before or straight after your quiet time to just get a piece of paper, a notebook or something, what electronic means maybe, and list all the things you want to do that day. As somebody has said, for every minute spent in organizing, an hour is earned. For every minute spent in organizing, an hour is earned. Now, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but a lot of time is saved by planning rather than just plunging into the first thing that comes to our minds. I think it's important to have only one to-do list, not one in paper, not one in this app, not one in your you know, Gmail or whatever, just one to-do list that has everything you need to do and then organized by priority. Keep the list with you through the day. Keep adding to it. Everything that needs to be done should go on that list. Don't really try not to carry anything about in your head, neither big nor small. It's amazing how much peace will be created in your mind by getting it out of your head and onto an outside piece of paper or piece of digital paper, whatever. I'd, I'd really do try to carry nothing in my head. I hate it. I've come to realize it's just a totally unnecessary stress for me. So, you know, as soon as I am I'm asked to do something, it goes in that to-do list. I use Wonderlist, and we'll come back to that. Yeah, let me, let me just talk about Wonderlist. If you go to my blog, you'll find, if you put in new student tips, um, you'll find uh, one of the posts of 13 or so I've done so far uh, on Wonderlist. Maybe you, actually you could put in Wonderlist. It's W-U-N-D-E-R-L-I-S-T. Uh, that has an iPad version and an iPhone version as well as a desktop version. What you're trying to do here is get an app or get a, get a methodology that is somewhere between too simple and too complicated. If you go just a simple piece of paper, right, or, you know, notes on your phone, 
Uh, how do you prioritise? Well, you have to basically rip the thing up every day and start again. Whereas if you do it digitally, and you've got a digital piece of software that you can you know, drag and drop in terms of prioritising what comes first, what date deadlines are due and so on, um, that's much better. But on the other hand, you have something like OmniFocus. In fact, Charlie's has got a blog on that today. You might want to look at it. I've tried OmniFocus, and to me it's just so complicated and, and convoluted that it actually adds to my stress. So you've got to find some method in between piece of paper and you know, running the Pentagon that, that suits you and that is going to help you rather than, than hinder you. So planning. Uh, Prioritising then. So you've got a list of all the things you need to do. You're not going to get everything done, ever. So you've got to let the least important things wait. So then that begins this organizing of your to-dos into the following categories. Urgent. So there are some things, phone calls, visits, emails, they simply have to be done that day. Straight up to the top of the list. Urgent. Second category is big. So you want to make sure you do something substantial every work day. So you're not just footering around on trivialities. There are lots of unimportant things on that list that you could fill your days with, but you'll never get anything big done. And by big, I mean work on a sermon, write an article, focus study in a certain area. Something that's going to take two or three hours of your time. It's so easy in the ministry to let lots and lots of little things squeeze out the big. And the little things are less demanding on the mind. Uh, they give you a sense of, I'm, I'm getting things done here, man. I'm ticking off all these boxes. But you've got to set time apart for longer term. And again, best to do this in the morning. You've got the right perspective in the morning before you're in the day and all the demands come upon you. So there's urgent things, there's big things. Uh, C, there are daily things. Now, there are some routine things that happen every day or they should happen every day. They're not urgent. The world won't fall apart if you don't do them. But if you let them build up, then you'll eventually become overwhelmed. So an example might be your email inbox, trying to get that to zero every day. Maybe non-urgent phone calls. Again, these can mount up. I always try and do one phone call a day. That's you know, not an urgent thing usually, but just lots of, you know, just errands on the phone, things to follow up, administrative matters. Organize your diary. Coordinate your diary with your wife. Check your bank accounts, balance, back up your data. Just, just daily things. You should all have a daily list of half a dozen things or so that just get done as a habit every day. Then there are visits and meetings. So you're asking yourself, do you have any visits? Do you have any meetings planned for the day? And then you try and work out the most efficient way of combining that with maybe other errands and tasks. What else can I do on that trip? And then there are long-term projects. So um, the big things are, you know, a couple of hours a day on the things like sermons. But I think pastors should always have at least one time slot in the week for working on a long-term project. Not just the weekly sermons and Bible studies and catechism classes. But, you know, work on an article for a magazine or... You know, a chapter on a book or a lecture maybe. Um, don't let them build up on you. If somebody's, you know, your church might have asked you, will you speak at the minister's retreat you know, in three months' time? Then don't wait till two weeks to go. You want to start on that early. You know, 
set aside Friday morning or something, or every Thursday morning, do a few hours, every week. If you don't schedule it, it will not get done. It's interesting, Andrew Carnegie once asked a consultant, what can you do for me about time control? And the consultant said, I'll make you one suggestion and you send me a check for what you think it's worth. Write down what you have to do on a piece of paper in order of priority. Complete the first item before you go to the second. It's reported that Carnegie tried it for a few weeks and sent him a check for $10,000. What? But, you know, <laughs> it's so simple. Um, and yet, so many of us don't actually do it. Prioritizing. If you do not prioritize, you'll end up very busy, very unproductive. And it's amazing what I often find, the things that I leave to the bottom of my list. You know, the things that are not long term, the things that are not big, the things that are not urgent, things that are not daily. It's amazing how they can just disappear. You eventually, oh, actually I didn't need to do that, or you know, somebody else has done it, or... And the problem is so many of these things end up at the top and the big things are undone. So we need to prioritize. Number four, we need to pick. Pick the right time for the right tasks. I'm sure you all know the famous figures. 80% of your results are achieved by 20% of the things that you do. It's the 80-20 rule. 80% of your results are achieved by 20% of the things that you do. You've got to find that, that 20% that's going to produce the 80%. If you don't set aside time for these tasks, they simply won't get done. So choose the right time slot as well for each task. Allocate enough time for it. I think it's very important to devote large blocks of time to important tasks and squeeze less important tasks into smaller blocks. Consolidate smaller, smaller tasks into one block. What do I mean by that? Well, you look at your diary and you see, well, I've got four hours on a Friday morning. That's your sermon prep time. Or you might look in your diary and see, hey, on Wednesday I've got 20 minutes between this class and the next class. I've got an hour here in the afternoon. And then I've got 15 minutes before my wife comes and picks me up or something. That's the time, not for sermon prep. That's the time for the phone calls and the emails, the small tasks. Put them into the small blocks of time. Consolidate them together as well to release larger blocks of time. And don't multitask. It doesn't exist. Everyone's finding that out. You're just toggling from one task to another. You're not doing two things at the one time. I think it's always helpful to try and visualize time. You're doing time management exercises. I hope you found some good apps and schedulers to help you block out with colors sermon prep time, study time, lecture time, whatever it is. I'd recommend Julie Morgenstern's book. It's on your reading list. To show you the difference between a cluttered schedule and an organized schedule. And um, if you've got a cluttered schedule, it's very difficult to see what you have to do. Whereas an organized schedule, it's very obvious. Uh, you don't need to guess. And it's also easier to find out, hey, have I reached my capacity here? Am I overdoing it? So pick the right time for the right tasks. Big blocks for big tasks. Small blocks for small tasks. Group smaller ones together rather than interspersed throughout the day. Don't multitask. Let's have a break. Let's take a good five minutes, okay? Uh, come back just after 25 to...
let, let me just show you a couple of blog articles that I referred to there. This is the new student tips. It wasn't really for you kind of new students. It was more like kids going from high school to, to college. But I, I think you'd probably find some useful stuff as well. At the end of the later articles, there's a list of the articles I've written. Um, on different areas of just getting organized as a student and um, the kind of apps and methodologies I use. I'm sure you have, all of you have your own things, but here's one on this first one here is called New Student Tip Number Six Calendar. So how to, how to run a calendar. Again, I, I'm not, you know, I'm sure most of you are pretty au okay fait with this, but you might find the odd tip there about how to organize yourselves in terms of using a calendar efficiently, scheduling and so on. Some of what I've said is there. And then new student tip number 11 is about time management. It's, there's probably some crossover with what I'm seeing here today. But again, I think you'll find some extra things that will help you maybe to to manage your time better. It's probably just takes the practice a little bit further. It's just a bit more down to earth. So you can have a look at that. Um, let's go back to where we were. So we were looking at pick, now let's fifthly look at perform and we're here addressing particularly the problem of procrastination. Andrew Carnegie said, no unwelcome task becomes any the less unwelcome by putting it off till tomorrow. And it's, the term itself is derived from a Latin word meaning to put off for tomorrow. There was a, a book recently published called The Thief of Time. Um, it was $55, so it's not going to be near the top of your book buying list. It's ironic, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a scholarly kind of book. I call it scholarly, triple the price, <laughs> usual. But the New Yorker has an extensive review of it, and I've summarized it um, for you. Number one, procrastination is painful. And I'm sure we all know this. We think it's sort of easier to procrastinate, but it's actually harder. Because when we see the same things on our list to do day after day after day, it gnaws away at us. And it eats away at us. So why do we avoid an unpleasant task when avoiding it only increases the unpleasantness? It's painful. Number two, it's costly. It makes businesses lose money. Uh, a history of GM, 60 to 0, written by Alec Taylor, highlighted how GM's problems really came about because key executives delayed and delayed inevitable decisions. But it's not only businesses that lose money, pastors lose credibility when they become known as procrastinators. <clears throat> and so do students. Um, it is irrational. Pierre Steele defines procrastination as willingly deferring something even though you expect the delay to make you worse off. It's crazy, isn't it? Willingly deferring something even though you expect the delay to make it worse. Samuel Johnson said, I could not forbear to reproach myself for having so long neglected what was unavoidably to be done and of which every moment's idleness increased the difficulty. Fourthly, it thrives in vagueness. 
Dave Allen, who wrote the famous book Getting Things Done, said that one of the advantages of having very clear, concrete tasks in your list says the vaguer the task, the more abstract the thinking it requires, the less likely you are to finish it. So in other words, you don't just put on the list um, counselling assignment. It's write self counselling paper. Full stop. It's not to be left vague, but very specific and action oriented. The vaguer the task, the more abstract the thinking, the less likely you are to get it done. It feeds on perfectionism. This was interesting to me. There's, I can't remember the book I, wrote, I read about this. I can't remember what it's called anyway. But it, it highlighted that most procrastinators are not like totally lazy people with no sense of responsibility. Actually, most of them are perfectionists. Uh, procrastinators are always waiting for the perfect time. General McClellan's excessive planning and preparation infuriated President Lincoln during the Civil War. He was always asking for more troops, more time, more weapons, more plans to get the ideal battle. It also picks the easy route. In an experiment, people were asked to pick one movie to watch that night and one to watch at a later date. Not surprisingly, for the movie they wanted to watch immediately, people chose very lowbrow comedies and big blockbusters. And when they were asked what movie they wanted to watch later, they were more likely to pick serious films, important films. The problem was that when time came to watch the serious movie, another frothy one was more appealing. And they resorted to that. Procrastination picks the easy route. Procrastination often arises when we have too much to do. When we're overwhelmed with to-dos, we feel there's often there's no to-do worth doing. We just get paralyzed. Uh, procrastination is increasing. According to Pierce Steele, who's a business professor at the University of Calgary, the percentage of people who admitted to difficulties with procrastination quadrupled between 1978 and 2002. And in that light, he's saying it's really the quintessential modern problem. Gretchen Rubin, who wrote The Happiness Project, New York Times bestseller, gives six tips for forcing yourself to do a dreaded task. Do it first thing in the morning. Do it now is one of her 12 commandments. No delay is the best way. If you find yourself putting off a task that you try to do several times a week, do it every day. What she means by that is, like, say you plan to jog three times a week or go to the gym three times a week. She says you are far less likely to do that than if you scheduled it, say, six days a week. So if you're saying, well, you know, I need, to, I need to prepare for my sermon two days a week, a few hours each day of these two days, you're less likely to do that than say you scheduled every day one hour first thing in the morning or something like that. And have someone to keep you company. Studies show we enjoy practically every activity more when we're with other people. So it might be a visit to... A home you're really dreading to visit? Well, take someone with you. Arrange to go with someone and when the time comes you don't have a choice. You've got to go. Number four, make preparations. Assemble the proper tools. Clean off your desk. Get the phone number. Find the file. When you're dreading a task, it helps to just get prepared for it. Commit. We've all heard the advice, write down your goals. And uh, so what Gretchen Rubin says is, she writes at the top of a piece of paper, by the end of today, April 7, I will have... And fill in the gap. Give yourself a deadline. And sixthly, remind yourself that finishing a dreaded task is tremendously energizing. 
Studies show that completing a task releases chemicals in the brain that give you pleasure. If you're feeling blue, although the last thing you feel like doing is something that you don't feel like doing, push yourself and you'll get a big lift from it. Other people suggest reward yourself. So for example, you say, well, if I do this paper today, I'm going to reward myself by buying a book on Amazon tonight or something like that. <laughs> Consult with your wife first. Break down huge tasks into smaller steps. Instead of saying, oh, man, I've got to write a book today, say, well, I've, I'll write two paragraphs today. Right. So perform, don't procrastinate. Pace. Now, some people live at the pace of a Wall Street trader. Other people live in the kind of let it all hang out kind of pace. Neither helps the leader or those he leads. Somewhere in between is where we should find ourselves. Now, it's going to vary depending on who you are and your circumstances. Um, but find a pace that allows you to get a good amount of work done. And yet allows you time for other people as well. Set yourself limits on work. You can spend as many hours as there are left in this world on preparing a sermon. You can. It's just endless. Now, some sermons will require more time than others, but you should have, generally speaking, set number of hours that you devote to writing a sermon. It shouldn't be open-ended. It should be set, I start here, I finish here, or I finish today here, and then tomorrow I finish up. Um, you've also got to be able to distinguish between tasks, some of which will require a high level of intelligence and commitment and alertness. You know, for example, if you're preaching in a nursing home on a Sunday afternoon, I'm not trying to diminish that as a, as a ministry, but it doesn't require as much preparation as a sermon, say, your main Sunday morning sermon. And it's wrong to devote equal amounts of time to the tasks. You have limited mental fuel, and you've got to expend it in the right ways. Also, pace your to-do list. If you get 10 extra things to do this week, try and do two a day rather than you know, try and do all 10 in one day. Breaks up the mountain. Try to speed up the tasks that are mundane, like email. I, I often use a stopwatch on my phone when I do email. I start it when I start the email and then figure out how long it took me at the end, and it's amazing how it speeds you up. You get it done half the time, even less maybe, when you're really putting yourself under that pressure. Otherwise, again, you can spend forever on emails. And uh, I suppose under this heading also of pace, we deal with exercise. You have to spend time exercising. You have to do it. You think, well, that's a waste of time. That's time away from work. It's not. Research has shown that exercise boosts cognitive function, creativity, problem solving, and productivity. A NASA study showed employees who exercised daily worked at 100% efficiency after seven hours work. Whereas those who didn't exercise saw a 50% Meaning it took them twice as long to accomplish the same thing. So exercise creates time for you. It doesn't waste time. And under pace also build in buffer time. Don't you know, shove everything right up against something else. Leave time for travel, for things going wrong. If you don't you go off schedule, it's almost impossible to get back in and you lose momentum. Seventhly, purge. One of the benefits of auditing our time, which I hope we've all done by now, is it usually helps to identify some time wasters that we need to get rid of. And even, as I'm sure as you found, even the act of recording time tends to have a 
purgative effect upon our days. I've started using myself the last couple of weeks, Toggle, T-O-G-G-L dot com. It's a free online um, timer that you can alloc- you know, describe the work you're doing. You start the clock and it's just amazing how it's just sharpened me and got my pace up a bit without you know, it all just becoming against the clock. Yeah, you have to be aware there of, of the internet itself. Find a way of controlling that, filters, blocks, and so on. Protect, number eight. According to Julie Morgenstern, the average information worker is interrupted by another person or by technology every 11 minutes. And it takes 25 minutes to refocus back to where you were. I don't actually understand that. How can you be interrupted 11 minutes and it takes you, every 11 minutes, it takes you 25 minutes to get refocused. It's bad anyway, whether you can understand it or not. So if you're ever going to get quality time for writing, thinking, you've got to protect your time. You've got to mark out an area and a time in your life that is you know, non-negotiable and non-interruptible. It's, it's as important as preaching time, as visiting time. For myself, mornings are the best for this. Um, I usually protect it in the ministry from 8 a.m. in the morning till 1 p.m. every day. Tu- no, sorry, Tuesday to Saturday. 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Tuesday to Saturday. Monday was my day off. Sunday was preaching. I informed my elders of this as well. It also percolated into the congregation. I put the phone on the answering machine. I shut down email. And I made a point of returning all phone calls at lunchtime and doing a quick check of email before I left for visiting and things like that to make sure there was nothing urgent I had to reply to. It, incoming calls, like when you receive a call, take an average of 11 minutes. Outgoing calls take an average of 7 minutes. Now, if you've got 5 or 6 phone calls, you're continually answering the phone. You're not only having longer phone calls, you've got all the interruptions. Whereas if you're able to then return calls one after another, you, you actually gain you know, a good number of minutes over the course of a week. So you want to be accessible, but you've also got to be productive. I ke- used to keep a I do it now online, but I used to have a notebook beside me. If you know any thoughts came to me, things I had to do, I just wrote it down rather than went and go and doing them. Didn't want the distraction. It got me, it got it off my mind. Um, number nine, pause. You need a Sabbath, like everyone else. It doesn't say six days you shall labour and do all your work, except when you're a pastor, in which case you'll work seven days a week. It doesn't say that. You need to take a day off, a full day off from work, with your family usually. I think I've told you before, only twice in my ministry did I manage to persuade my wife that I had to work Monday. And by Friday, Saturday, I realized I hadn't accomplished any more in the course of the week. I was just shattered and doing everything slower. Number 10, the price. I just want to convince you of the value of time. I hope I've done that. And as you get older, the value of time increases. You have less of it to spend. But develop a real sense of value of time from an early stage in life. I want to finish off here. Allow time for questions, I hope. By describing two kinds of life. We have this battle in the ministry Uh, between accessibility and uh, productivity. How how do we balance this? Well, New York Times columnist David Brooks wrote about two ways of thinking about life. He called them the well-planned life and the summoned life. Let's let's look at the well-planned life first of all. Uh, 
Um, Brooks's description of this it leaned heavily on the Harvard commencement address given by Clayton Christensen in 2010. Clayton Christensen is a Harvard Business School professor and a serious Christian. Brooks underlined Christensen's Christian commitment by narrating how he refused to play college sports on a Sunday. But, Brooks says, Christensen combines a Christian spirit with a business methodology. He says in plotting out a personal and spiritual life, he applies the models and theories he developed as a strategist. He emphasizes finding the right metrics, efficiently allocating resources, and thinking about marginal costs. When he is done, life comes to appear as a well-designed project, carefully conceived in the beginning, reviewed and adjusted along the way, and brought toward a well-rounded fruition. Christensen observed, though, how high achievers usually misallocate their resources. If they have a spare half hour, they use it to produce some tangible result at work, like closing a sale or writing a blog, rather than investing their time and energy in far more important things like relationships, which may not yield results for maybe up to 20 years later. Christensen's advice, invest a lot of time when you are young in finding a clear purpose for your life. When I was young, he said, I was in a very demanding academic program, trying to cram an extra year's worth of work into my time at Oxford University. I decided to spend an hour every night reading, thinking and praying about why God put me on this earth. That was a very challenging commitment to keep, because every hour I spent doing that, I wasn't studying applied econometrics. I was conflicted about whether I could really afford to take that time away from my studies, but I stuck with it and ultimately figured out my purpose in life. Having done that, he says, you're then able to make the right decisions about time management and talent multiplication. Now, in a sense, you all have your life purpose, but um, I think you can make it more specific. I think that's where we can learn from Christensen here that what kind of ministry am I going to have? What kind of preaching? What kind of visiting? Taking time out to really think this through. What is the best? What is the ideal? What suits me? What suits that situation that I'm going to go into ultimately? A well-planned life. Secondly, there's the summoned life, which Brooke says is lived from an entirely different perspective. Life isn't a project to be completed, it's an unknowable landscape to be explored. A 24-year-old can't sit down and define the purpose of life in the manner of a school exercise because she's not yet deep enough into the landscape to know herself or her purpose. So, instead of plotting a course like a strategic planner, we should wait for the course to unfold and respond accordingly. The person leading the summoned life starts with a very concrete situation. I'm living in a specific year, in a specific place, facing specific problems and needs. At this moment in my life, I'm confronted with specific job opportunities and specific options. The important questions are, what are these circumstances summoning me to do? What is needed in this place? What's the most useful social role before me? Such questions can only be answered by sensitive observation and situational awareness, not calculation and long-range planning. In America, we have been taught to admire the lone free agent who creates new worlds. But for the person leading the summoned life, the individual is small and the context is large. Life comes to a point not when the individual project is complete, but when the self dissolves into a larger purpose and cause. Now, Brooks says the individualistic planned life is more common in America, whereas the more social summoned life is more common elsewhere. So which is best? I think you can probably begin to detect two models of ministry here, can't you? Well, Brooks is a moderate in every way and, as usual, comes down firmly on the fence. 
by concluding they're probably useful, both useful for a person trying to live a well-considered life. Well, we shouldn't really be asking what's American, what's un-American, but what's biblical. Well, the person who lives a well-planned life takes time to find a clear life purpose, then makes appropriate decisions about how to spend their time and use their talents. The summoned life is a person who rejects the possibility of long-term planning. But as situations and circumstances arise, they ask, what are these circumstances summoning me to do? You might call it the reactive life. What should the Christian live? Let's have a vote here. Who's for the well-planned life? Okay. Who's for the summoned life? Who's for both? <laughs> well, I'm kind of for both, but I'm much more in favour of the well-planned life. Let me explain that. No Christian should be just a victim of events, just a kind of a helpless cork being tossed to and fro by the ever-changing ocean of circumstances and other people's expectations. We've got to take time to prayerfully seek a life and ministry purpose. God put each of us here for a specific purpose, a specific reason, and we shouldn't just drift day to day, week to week, year to year, frittering away time with no sense of direction. We've got to take our time and talents to God and ask him, what will you have us to do? And wait for his guidance. And you know, if we did that, it would save a lot of Christians and a lot of ministers too. Many years of pointless ping-ponging around from job to job, from church to church, from passion to passion, from person to person, from place to place. However, there are dangers in the well-planned life. Especially in the selfish neglect of important relationships. The person living the well-planned life can become very insensitive to circumstances, to events, to people around him. I don't care if my neighbor's sick. I've got a plan today and I'm sticking to it. He can become very frustrated with anyone who interrupts his plan or renders his day inefficient. He can become deaf to God's voice speaking to him through his word and through providence as his life unfolds. So he may have got his life plan from God, but he doesn't get his everyday plan from God. Everyone needs to allow an element of a reactive life in his life. So I suppose I'm joining David Brooks on the fence here, but definitely leaning over onto the well-planned life side. I believe it's more biblical than the reactive life. I think that's what we see in Christ's life. He didn't get up every day and wonder, what am I doing here? Where am I going? No, he had a very definite plan. I don't suppose we'd call it a life plan, we'd call it a death plan. And he received that from his father. But he also had a good balance, didn't he? Between the well-planned life and the reactive life. There were times when he would not be deflected by people's demands and the pressure of unpredicted events. But there were other times when he did respond to pressure and urgent circumstances. From what I've seen, most pastors live reactive lives. They go from day to day responding to events, phone calls, emails, and others' agendas. There may be a plan to like prepare two or three sermons a week, but not much more than that. So I'd encourage you to think more long term. Not just about your congregation, where it's going, but where are you going? What is your life for? Take your time, take your talents, take your interests to God 
and, and take your schedule and, and say, Lord, help me to find a long-term plan. Maybe a project. Maybe, maybe to master Greek or Hebrew. I don't know. Maybe research a favourite subject. Maybe do a THM or a DMIN. Maybe write a book. Maybe build interest and mission to a particular place in the world. Maybe mentor a young man or young, a group of young men. But, but some project, some long-term project, some long-term plan, allocate certain time to it every week, if possible. Stick to it. Let others know about it. Um, I, I honestly believe the person who lives the well-planned life reacts better to events than the person who lives the reactive life. But whatever we do, it's got to be a prayerful life, hasn't it? So we ask God, what will you have me do today, but also the longer term? I want to give you a little equation. Maybe better if I write it up here. See if you can make sense of this. Anyone want to interpret that formula? Is it meant to be an equals there? No, I haven't. I mean, we could. You could put um, equals the ideal life, let's call it. So, the plan to life is 80% reactive, but all of it has to be prayer life. Yeah. That's what I found works fairly well for me. It might be different proportions for you, but I think it combines both elements, yet with leaning over to the planned life and just bathing everything in a prayer life. I think that will help us with long-term time management, but also the daily battles as well. So, disagree. Debate me. Is there another way of viewing this? Anyone found the opposite? Does this repulse you? Some people, some ministers would be appalled at this. They should say, this should be a 100% reactive life. You're a servant, you're a shepherd, you're... Craig? I, I appreciate this up here. When text that came to my mind that I'd want to be able to explain well is Christ saying, take no thought for the morrow, for mm -hmm. the evil of right. the day is sufficient. So how would somebody explain that to Craig? Does that mean we don't plan at all? The usual way of explaining it is take no anxious thought for tomorrow. You know, thoughts that are crushing you and burdening you. And for me, one of the ways to avoid that, Craig, one of the ways I put into practice take no anxious thought for tomorrow is this kind of thing. David? I wouldn't change that a little bit. Okay. I'd put brackets before the 70 and after the RL. Okay, hold on. <laughs> after, after what? Right at the start. Okay. And then after the RL. Okay. And change that plus. Oh, okay, right, okay, okay. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Is there a difference? Yep. Yep. No. Your, your effectiveness in that is affected by your brain. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yep. So, time management in general, any questions, any thoughts? Just one quick comment. Um, Jonathan Edwards has got a great um, a sermon or discourse on procrastination. Oh, does he? Right. Very convicted. Okay. Um, really exposed. And it's not long, it's in his works. Okay. But, um, obviously, his works is very small print. Right. Um, it's probably equivalent to a dozen pages or so. What does he call it? Does he call it procrastination? Yeah. yeah. Well, you could go to. Um, the works of Jonathan Edwards online and put that word in procrastination you'll get a nice lay, lay, nicely laid out yeah, sermon yeah. Yeah. yeah you've got younger eyes than me I think 
Well, that, that tiny print in the works, no? Yeah. I'm just a train setter, you know. Yeah. It's an old <laughs> fogey. <laughs> Craig? <coughs> Planning is, is crucial. Like you're saying, it should be a big part of our life. How do you avoid becoming a worry wart or always wondering what if this or what if that and I need to have my garage stocked with two years of food in case the society collapses, that kind of thing. How do you avoid the extreme? Well, stop listening to Glenn Beck, number <laughs> one. <laughs> I don't know, Craig, I, I don't suppose that's kind of ministry focus. That's just a, a general yeah. problem, isn't it, that, yeah. that, that some people have. Well, I, I tend to think um, of what if series, I don't like <coughs> back, but I can tend to think of, get carried away, what if this... And that, and that, and that. A better plan for that. And I waste time doing stuff. Well, I'll tell you how I'll answer that. Next class time, I'll, I'll bring a sermon on the causes and cures of worry, okay? Thank you. David. You, on, on those blog posts, you listed uh, six electronic tools that we could use. And how do you track them all? Yeah, you've got right. you've, you've got the one that I'm looking at now, Wonderlist, yeah. which is clearly an overlap with the calendar. How do you put well, them all together? How do you yeah, I don't think it is because the general rule is you never use your calendar for a to-do list. Okay. You never put tasks on your calendar. So that's the way I separate the two things. Um, I, I, Tim Challies has been running a great series on this the last few weeks on productivity and productivity tools and you'll find him much better on this than I am. But um, yeah, Wonderlist to me is just my to-do list and it's very helpful to, to be able to put deadlines on it because then you know I get pings when the warning is near and that keeps that off the calendar whereas calendar is just used for meetings like lectures and things like that. See, that's, that's last week, and that's my to-do list. Right, right. I have a smartphone, can't afford that. Is, is it still? You, David, you've got to, I mean, I've gone to paper at times as well. Um, I've swung backwards and forwards, and you've got just got to find what suits you best. You're probably following the same principles, like get everything off your mind, you know, out, outside of yourself so that you've, is that you know it's there, you're not worrying that you're going to forget. So whether you do it in digital or, or paper, you know, it's a matter of, of what works for you. Hmm. Okay, well, let's wrap up. I would encourage you, I think there are a number of links, um, maybe at the end of the outline, certainly on the populi to various time management things. There's a, a really good website called Time Management Ninja, which is really neat brief posts on time management that you know, can just go through his archives. It tends to be a bit repetitive, so once you've read a year's worth, you've certainly read everything he's got to say, but he is really good. You'll find lots of tips there. Phil, maybe you would close in prayer for us, please.
bad in mind that we would use it 